I'd like to welcome everyone this afternoon to creating an engaging discussion exercise. This is part two. It's an encore performance because I have to tell you, threaded discussions are exciting things. Uh, my name is Armita Reitzel. I'm a professor of communication here at Humboldt State University, and I've been using threaded discussions for a while now. I started out using threaded discussions when I went to develop a fully online class in public speaking about five years ago. But I've been using threaded discussions in both my fully online classes and more recently in my totally face to face classes as well. The reason I do it, well, we're going to find out why. And I'm hoping that you'll at least consider doing this with your classes as well. What I'm going to be doing this afternoon is giving you a few tips for using an online discussion exercise, also known as the threaded discussion. And what I'm going to do is, since I've already given a first part to this, do a very quick review. And so these PowerPoint slides will be made available to you if you want to take a little more time to look at them. But I want to do a quick review of what I covered in part one. I think it's very important from the get-go, if you're going to use a threaded discussion, to know why you're going to use a threaded discussion. That is, what are the goals? What are you trying to accomplish? How will the threaded discussion help you uh, further on the accomplishment of your student learning outcomes. And think about how this exercise can contribute to other course activities and assignments. Let me give you one quick example of something that I've been doing that has been really successful. In one of my fully online classes, I had the students do a threaded discussion. That threaded discussion then becomes a test question on the next test. Then I do a version of it on the final exam. So the students have a chance to explore ideas, get feedback from one another and from me as a professor. They then can put it into a test as one of their test responses. And then further along, later in the semester, they have an opportunity to revisit it again. So when I do my threaded discussions, it's not just a one-shot deal. It's not just something I put into the checkbook, into the grade book and make a check mark and there it's done. I really do use the threaded discussions throughout the semester. I think it's very important to provide context for the assignment. That is, uh, give them a good assigned reading. I use TED Talks a lot in the uh, uh, presentations that I do, but give them something, some content that they're dealing with, and then give them that as the opportunity to explore it a bit more through a threaded discussion. And again, I'll make this a slide available to you so you can have more time to look at each of these points. Give your students, oh, this is so important. Give your students really clear directions. I find in the student evaluations, the students really appreciate the fact that I really clearly spell out what they need to do and explain kind of why they need to do it as well. So give very specific prompts. You'll see some examples of things I've done. Give them a word limit. Now, again, that's a decision that you need to make, but I find students really appreciate that word limit. Students who are very wordy, well, it kind of brings them in to something that's usable. Uh, and students who you have to kind of nudge a little bit, well, they know what you're looking for. And so I think word limits can be very helpful to students. Specific due dates and times. Usually the first post is on a particular day of the week. Try to be consistent through the semester what day of the week something is due. And then three or four, I usually do four, but three or four days later, have the second part of the prompt where students respond to each other. That gives them time to review other prompts, that, uh, or, um, other um, posts to the prompts, and it gives them an opportunity then to think about how they want to respond to each other. A number of points. I found that I was not giving enough points early on when I first started using voice, th or sorry, threaded discussions. I give students more points as the semester goes on. I'll start with a few points for the first one, add a few more points onto the second. By the time we get to the final one, it might be worth a chunk of change. But by that time, students have developed the skills and have the idea of what I'm looking for in those threaded discussions. Provide a rubric, and towards the end of the presentation, I'll show you a terrific rubric that I found online. So that resource will be made available to you. And then a sample. Give students a sample about how to respond to a prompt. Now, I actually do my own assignments. I don't know how many of you do that, but I found that, wow, I'm a hard teacher at times. 
And so I actually do my assignments. And when I do my assignments, I kind of modify thinking, oh, gosh, if I were a student answering this, how might I want to answer it? Or what limitations do I have by the way it's set up? So what I typically do early on, I don't do it later on in the semester. I provide the students a sample of what a good response could be. And I provide a couple of samples of how to respond to each other. That's really important. Provide structure. And then consider giving your students some choices. I might have two or three different readings for them to respond to. They would choose one of those to respond to. What happens in the threaded discussion is they end up getting involved in discussions of the other ones because other students have made other choices. So all the, all the different content gets discussed, but a student feels like they've got some choice in the matter. And I think that's really important. You'll see an example of that with some TED Talks later on. And then create your groups thoughtfully. During my first session that I did on threaded discussion, somebody asked, well, how many should be in a group? depends on what you want the group to accomplish. I typically teach classes around the side, usually around 30 students. I will never have a threaded discussion, except maybe for the introduction one with all 30 students. That would make for a gigantic, gigantic, ginormous threaded discussion. It would take forever to get to the bottom of that thing. I typically will do, for, at the beginning, two groups, two groups of 15 to get a feel for who the students are. If students drop out of the course, then and it goes down a little bit. Um, if I, if depending upon the situation, I might be really interested in having very much smaller groups if I want a little bit more collaboration going on. So I really do think about how many students I want in a group. Sometimes I will usually I'll keep the same groups, but once in a while I like to change things up so it's not always the same ten or always the same fifteen responding to each other. So again, that's a choice that you can make as an instructor. And we'll keep going. Just a little bit more. Model what you want the students to do. Use the students' names when you respond to them. That way they feel like you're really making that indiv individual connection. So I will say, hi, so-and-so. Or let's say, I'll use Sue. I'll use you for the example. Hi, Sue. That was a terrific discussion response. It really got me thinking. And then at the end, I actually asked my students to say, to respond with thanks or best regards or great work and then their name. So in a way, it's like a little mini old fashioned. Remember those things called letters that we used to write? I try to get them to do that a little bit too. Um, and then ask a question or two to encourage a student to continue with their discussion. So these are all things that I put into my first responses to students. And again, the first uh, talk that I did had some examples of that. I'd be glad to share more with you later but I gotta keep going. Okay, and then here's the other thing. Students who go above and beyond. I do give some extra credit sometimes to students who go above and beyond. That it's like, whoa, this was an idea I had never thought about. It just kind of blows my mind. I reward students, but that would be an extra credit kind of thing. So think about whether or not you want to employ extra credit. I find that if I give students extra credit on occasion, Oh my gosh, they, they, they are just ready to jump in there. They give it their all. I just finished grading, uh, figuring out the final grade for a student who was very, very um, shy at the beginning of the semester. And now she's my threaded discussion superstar. She, she gives fantastic responses and she's very encouraging of her peers as well. And I think it may be partially, I gave her some positive feedback, but I also gave her a little bit of extra credit here and there to really spur her on. Now, here's something you might want to consider doing. I, I'm, I love, I, in my next life, I'm going to be a computer nerd, I think. But I love trying out new things. And so I, I, for a couple of semesters, I tried out these trading cards. Now, they're kind of fun. I mean, I'm into baseball. When we get baseball back again, I'm going to go to some major league games. But I developed these baseball card things for one of my classes. But I found some students found this intimidating. They couldn't figure it out how to do it, even though, from my perspective at least, the directions were really, really clear. And I tried to explain to them how to upload it into Canvas. Some of them, I was spending more time and they were spending more time on just trying to upload than I wanted to spend with the tech stuff. That's important to think about when you're doing these threaded discussion. 
how much do you want to put into the tech side of it? So think about giving students opportunities to practice on Canvas in a safe space. So I know I showed this last time for my first talk, but I created this semester for my students a threaded discussion, zero points. It was just extra for them to do it, use it as a practice pad, how to embed an image into a discussion post. I gave them directions. If, you, if I were to click here, we go to a Google Doc. And I didn't make a screenshot of this, but a lot of students tried it out and they actually ended up giving each other feedback when one image didn't come up right, they helped each other. So I, had, I didn't even have to do very much whatsoever. I think they felt safe because they could practice, they could make mistakes in a safe environment and that kept them going. So, Sue, I'm gonna to turn to you now. So are there any questions out there at the moment? I know I'm talking really fast, but I've got so much to share. At the moment, there aren't any questions. In okay, the we're gonna keep going then. Are you guys ready? Okay, I see at least a few nods there. Okay, so we're gonna move on to some examples now. These examples are not from the beginning of the semester. Uh, so they're not the first ones I would use. So keep in mind when I show you these examples, these are examples that are coming up uh, a few weeks into the semester or here at the end of the semester. If you want to see some early uh, samples, those are in the first uh, presentation that I did. So this is a threaded discussion activity and a fully online class. It was something that I developed several years ago in American Public Discourse. This was used early, not at the beginning, but early in the semester. So what I did in that class is I designed it specifically for American Public Discourse. I, use pop, I do pop culture in that uh, course. And I used a song that every student knew. I don't know, had some of you have heard of Beyonce's album Lemonade? Okay, they were really into it. Now keep in mind, this is 2017 when I wrote this. So that was fairly new at the time. And what I did is I give a little background here. Down here, I will always include for the students the course learning outcome. So they understand if they read it, uh, how this connects back to the course. So I always do that. It's a good marker for me. It frames the activity, plus it gives the students some information. Why are we doing this thing? It's, and it's not just for fun. So I snuck a little bit of teaching in by giving a short definition of what a visual album was. So I stuck a little uh, snuck a little teaching in. Then I very clearly said, here's the first discussion post. It's due by a particular time. The date is there. And then this one, I had them do a lot of different parts to this. I had them actually do three parts to this one. I've gone back to just having them do a, a part A and a part B, rather than a part A, B, and C. So this, again, one of my early ones. So what I did is for this one, my goodness, I gave them a lot of very specific directions. Why did I do that? It was early in the semester, and if they hadn't, they'd only done, I believe, one graded discussion thread before. So I wanted to give them a lot of, of uh, structure, a lot of prompts to kind of guide them into success. That was the idea behind this. So here I give them the lyrics first, then after they read the lyrics, they're supposed to respond to these questions. And then again, I have my word limit here. Then after they do that first paragraph, they go into the second. Now that seems like a lot of directions, but I wanna tell you, it did provide that structure that my students needed at this point. Take two, this time they're reading the lyrics, they're listening to the music and they're watching the visuals. So now they're inundated by Beyonce and what's going on at the beginning. I have a lot more questions, whoops, sorry. I have a lot more questions for them. Uh, but then down here, if you look here, then choose two of the questions to answer. This is where I'm giving my students some choices. So there are some questions everybody has to answer to give us a foundation, but then choices are provided. Then down here, they choose one of these questions to answer. And for me, it's always interesting to see which ones that the students will choose. And then again, I put in the word limit down here. Then there's part three. Again, I really got into all the different parts. So there was quite a bit here. But I wanted to share that with you as an example of something that I did early on in threaded discussions, fairly early in the semester. Now I wanna give you, and I'm watching time here. Oh, we're doing pretty well. 
I'm going to give you a couple of examples of things that I've done. This is a threaded discussion activity in a fully online class at the end of the semester. In fact, the students just finished this one. And I did get a couple of students to give me permission that I could share part of their responses. So I did get, do the FERPA thing. I got their written permission so I can share this with you. So this is from this semester, so it's hot off the press, literally. So um, you'll see here, whoops, sorry about that. I have two discussion groups. This is a class of 23 students right now. We started off at 25, it went down to 23. For this assignment, I decided to make a different threaded discussion since it was the last one of the semester, two groups. So I have a little intro there. I have my student learning outcomes that go back to what I have in the syllabus so they know why they're doing this. What I did in this one is I had my students watch um, a couple of TED Talks. So they were supposed to watch this one first, The Danger of a Single Story. And notice up here, I don't have a lot up here, do I? The reason I don't have a lot as much as I did in the earlier one, it's, it's later in the semester. My students are now becoming threaded discussion pros. They know what they need to do. And they really, my gosh, I was so impressed with the quality of what they wrote for this last one. And it, this is the one that probably has the least amount of direction because they get it already. So they could watch, they needed to watch this. And this becomes important because I did ask a test question on it in their final. Don't tell anybody, I have a couple of students who need, still need to take the final here. Then I had them watch this TED Talk. So they had to watch both of them. After watching both, then they have a choice. So this was due last, uh, last week. Choose one of the TED Talks to focus your responses are. They, I had to summarize in their own words what the TED Talk was about, and then choose a specific passage or two to highlight, describe, reflect on, uh, give a specific citation. I talk about um, how many words it has to be, and the more in-depth, the more points you'll earn. Notice, that's not a lot of direction, but these students have now already figured out what I'm looking for. So I don't need to give them much more than this at this point in time. And then I added a little bit more for each one. For the danger of a single story, what's a personal narrative? You've heard or experience that made a difference in your understanding of a person or a culture. And in the second one, don't ask where I'm from, ask where I'm a local. If someone were to ask you, where are you a local? How would you respond and why? So keep in mind, this is my intercultural communication class. I've been teaching them about cultures and co-cultures, identity development throughout the entire semester. And I go ahead and give them this. The second part is responding to the post of one peer at the end of the semester. And again, um, that's the way that I ended this particular one. I, would, I, just, I was so excited when I saw the quality of my students' uh, responses. Uh, here's a submission below from one of my students. I did get permission from her to share this with you. She talks about, I just watched the talk, The Danger of a Single Story. Uh, she goes on about the people that uh, the, the speaker met the shocking generalizations that were made. I thought she did a really good job with just a few words. Because 100, you know, this is what, about 150 words or so. It's not a lot, but she summarized that very well. And then I wanted to go on a little bit more. I told her I would not share all of her uh, 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 post, but this is the second paragraph to her post. The reason I wanted to share this with you, she makes that connection to the book and class material. She says specifically chapter, the chapter in our book that talks about media framing. She goes in about uh, the globe's cultural uh, media frames lead to stereotypes and prejudice. Oh my gosh, she gives me the chapter from the book. She gives me the page number. She goes on and on. I wish I could share the whole thing with you. She wrote a phenomenal essay in the discussion thread. In fact, all my students did. I mean, I was so impressed. I have to tell you guys one thing I'm going to confess. I get so excited about threaded discussions because I never think they're going to work, and they always work better than I ever expect them to. I know I probably shouldn't have shared that with you, but I get so excited because the students do so well on these. I was very impressed with the quality of what the student was writing about and the fact she made specific connections to course material and pointed it out to me where she found those connections. I, I was in seventh heaven when I read this one. 
And then here's one from another student. She did the other video. And again, this was a huge post that she made. But again, phenomenal writing, phenomenal writing, talking about don't ask where I'm from, ask where I'm local. She did such a good job describing the TED Talk. Then she takes a specific passage from it. She puts it into her post. That makes it very easy for myself or the students to respond to her. Then she begins to talk about the quote. And again, she goes into so much depth. And, and it's, so, it's such a quality-driven type of response. I'm very impressed. So these are students who just in the course of, what, 15 weeks? And then take one week out because we didn't have classes one week in there either. Uh, they've done phenomenal work with this kind of, of writing, thinking, and it's really impressed me. So I really like using threaded discussions here at the end of a semester. It's something different from a final exam or that final paper per se. And again, she goes on a little bit more. Then finally, and we are doing well with time, I want to show you a course activity in a face-to-face -face class, which I'm sure we've all now this semester, we went from face-to-face -to, -face to now fully online. Well, this was a class that I was teaching totally face-to-face, -to -face, and we had to go suddenly online. So I think we're kind of all in the same boat here. What did we do? So this is now due, it's actually the second part of this is due tonight. Their final exam time was this morning, but I gave them until tonight to get the last part in. I'm actually using this threaded discussion as their final exam in the class. So this is from this semester, my American Public Discourse class. Since it's in action, I don't have examples to share with you since they're still responding as I speak, hopefully. Uh, but I wanted to share with you, this is a class I have 30 students in this class. I decided to have them divided into two groups. I have two groups of 15. Um, some of the students I know are taking the class now credit, no credit because of the pandemic and changing. So some of them are not responding because they're just going for the C at this point. Does anybody else have that happening in their classes? Students are going for the C. So I don't have as many. Normally I would have made these groups of 10, but because some students are not participating because they've already gotten their C in the class, that's why I have two groups of 15 to make sure there are enough responses. I have, uh, I decided since I have a lot of graduating seniors in this class, it's an upper division GE course, I decided to have them watch commencement speeches. Now, ironically, I, had, I did this assignment in class fall semester. And so what I did is I took my fall semester in class activity, turned it into a threaded discussion. So I have here as I do, since we have students graduating, on Saturday, virtually, I decided, well, what the heck, this is really timely at this point. So I have, whoops, you can see already, I have the different speeches here that are TED Talks. I had the student learning outcomes that students needed to do. They had to watch all three. And then here are the, uh, here's the assignment, choose one. Again, I keep the idea, they make choices. Choose one of the three commencement speeches to write your final American uh, public discourse analysis on, because that's what I teach them in the class, how to do a rhetorical analysis, identify the speech, then identify or address these different prompts that I have, what was significant, give time frames, how did it uh, contribute to the message. They, all, they should all know about ethos, pathos, and logos, so how did that tra get translated into the speech, and how effective was the speech. Now, throughout the semester, they've been trained to do this kind of analysis. So what's really exciting is that I'm getting, and as you can see, it's due tonight, so that's why I don't have any examples for you right now. But it's really exciting to see the students take what they've learned, share it out in their very many different ways of writing. I love watching their responses back to each other. I just love reading them. They're fantastic. And then, whew, I tell you, I'm a speech teacher. I'm getting this done in 30 minutes. Let me ask. Any questions? Sue, are there any questions up there that I can answer? Indeed, got lots of good questions. Uh -oh. um, I have one for Claire about, I have a question about how points are assigned and what are the grading criteria? Good question. Um, I'm gonna tell you how I assign points early. How I assign them early on is different from how I assign them later on. Early on, it's mainly participation. Are they responding, these kinds of things. Then what I do as the course goes on and the prompts become deeper and deeper in terms of meaning, of substance, 
I, in, I assigned a certain number of points in terms of how well do they answer the prompt that I'm giving? How much depth are they showing? And Claire, if you can hang on, I've got a slide coming up. Actually, I'm gonna get some other questions. Sue, remind me of Claire's question because I've got a rubric I wanna show everybody. I have a rubric that I really like and I wanna share it with all of you that you could consider using or modifying for your use. So Claire, I'll come back to the second part of your question. All right, Armida, we have a question from Roxanne about the timing. Do you have threaded discussions every week, every other week? That's a really good question. Um, I've done the almost every week routine. That becomes almost too much. So my recommendation would be for a class of 15 weeks, I think five threaded discussions are kind of right on the money. Now that means threaded discussions of content. I wouldn't do more than five threaded discussions of content because that would be about every other week or so. Because at the beginning of the semester, I do a threaded discussion of introduction. So that's separate from my threaded discussions of content. But I, I think every week other, I think every week students just aren't, after a while it's too much of a good thing and they stop really giving it their all. So that would be my recommendation. That's a personal recommendation from me. Good question. All right, um, Malia has a question. In addition to threaded discussions, what strategies and activities do you use early in the semester to build community for online um, students? Oh my gosh, oh, Malia, we need to talk. I've got so many cool things. Um, and I actually did some of that talk in my first presentation that I did, which hopefully will be up online soon, right, Sue? Um, and I have a PowerPoint. It, it could everybody, Sue, could you um, uh, get a copy of the chat at the end so I can get everybody who's here? If you're yeah. interested, put a little smiley face or do something so we know you're interested. I will send you my PowerPoints because I've got examples. And I gave a lot of examples in my first uh, presentation. I think one of the most important things, if you don't get that community going at the beginning, it's really, really hard to have a successful fully online or I think face-to-face -face class either way. So that's a good question. Hopefully the other presentation can help out. Anything else? Um, yes, but I just want to let everybody know, I just put in the chat the, uh, the link to the CTL workshops page like we're having now so it's upcoming ones and recorded ones so Armida's first um, well part one of this discussion um, workshop is already up there and we'll add this um, part two and I'd be again be happy to send everybody the, the powerpoints both of them if you're interested and if you ever want to talk about it I get excited so you can always email me we can set up a zoom session I can show you all my really cool backgrounds that I've got and teach you how to do cool zoom backgrounds Sue's laughing because I was showing her a bunch of the ones I made. I'm going to have to share some of those later. Okay. You are a star. <laughs> Presentation and backgrounds. We got a couple questions. Let's see. We, let's get to them. Um, Amy asks, uh, is there a reason for unusual due times for... Oh, okay. That's a good question. I do it purposefully. I really, really do. Um, because I find sometimes if you wait till 11.59 p.m., which is the traditional time, uh, students kind of forget about it because it's just the traditional time. Also, I did notice that I believe it's, are we having some downtime at 11.59 one night? I mean, so the, sometimes repairs are done to Canvas and that kind of thing. So you got to be a little careful about that. I'll tell you why I pick weird times around 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. There's two reasons. First, I'm still awake. And if a student is in jeopardy or they're having some kind of issue and they're frantically emailing me, I'm still up where I could calm them down. So honestly, that's one reason. My due dates, or my due times are really like between nine and like 1030 because I'm still up and I can help them. Secondly, at Humboldt, I believe when, I don't know if IT is still open this late, but if students were having technical problems, they could go to the help desk until 10 o'clock at night. That's my recollection at the library. And so if something was due either nine something or shortly after 10 o'clock, then they could still get some tech help in that regard. So that's one reason. If it's midnight, they can't get tech help, they're freaking out. So I'm trying to do it actually for them so I can help them out or the IT people can help them out. So that's the reason. Plus, it's funny, students remember these weird times. Oh, they said, oh, you're the 1018 professor, aren't you? 
I mean, they remember me years later about the time my, my assignments were due. So yeah, good question. Okay, there was a reason have, to it, yeah. We have another uh, question from Sean. Are there things you would not use a threaded discussion for? And if so, why? Ooh, good question. I don't think I've ever thought about that question before. I think potentially anything could be a threaded discussion, but it depends upon if you can come up with good prompts. So it's the questions you ask, going beyond just simply rote memorization types of things. I want them to think. So anything where it's just rote, uh -uh, I don't think it's worth it. Um, hmm. I'd have to think about that. Sean, you gave me a good question. Let me think about that more. But right now, I can't think of much I wouldn't use. It would be, what is the purpose of what I'm doing it for? And usually I'm doing it to get students to think. So that's, that's why I wouldn't do something if it really wasn't get them to think. I hope that answers that. Oh, you stumped me, Sean. Um, we are at um, 34 minutes into the oh. workshop. Okay. Not everybody's still here with us. Um, Can I do a little bit more, or is there another question? A little bit, a little bit more. That would God, be I don't want to do a part three. Oh, okay. Ed. Go, go for it. No, no, go ahead. If there's another, I should take the question. Uh, Heidi has a question about outside of breaking them into small groups, any recommendations for using a threaded discussion with a large class? I have 50 plus and 75 plus students. Okay, let me tell you what I did one time and I would, I would still break them down. When I taught my American public discourse class totally online back in 2017, I had 60 students. Um, so I made it one of those mega classes. That's what, what I ended up doing. And in each class, I broke them down into two separate groups. So I ended up having four groups. It also makes it a lot easier for me to do the grading Oh, see, I need to do now a part three because I was going to talk about how to grade threaded discussions more. Uh, but in the grading of it, um, you've got to make it doable for you as an instructor, too. So I, I, would, I would give them the same prompts, but they would be broken out into different groups within the two sections that I had. Um, so I think it's doable. I think one question I would have is what is the purpose? How can you make it doable for you? So you might want to have smaller discussion topics so that you're able to grade along the way. And you might want to honestly there, think about the quantity. How many of these do you want to have? Because it is a different approach to grading. It does take some time to grade the threaded discussions. I'm going to be honest about that. Can you, speak, can you speak to how much time it takes? Um, it, you know, it really depends. Um, at the beginning, I'm spending, for example, the first couple of, of uh, discussions I do, I write responses to every single student. So that takes a lot of my time, but I think it's important to show what, how to respond as a sample, plus it shows me as an instructor. My presence is known, which is really important in an online classroom. It, it's not a correspondence class. We really need to be present. Uh, but it does take me time to do that, but the prompts aren't huge, so it's usually fairly quick, even though there's a lot of things to do. Later on, um, I just go into speed grader to tell you the truth, and I did have a little uh, mock-up in my, my slideshow here about speed grader. It shows you the main post and then any of the response posts. That is so, that makes my life so much easier when it comes to grading. So when it comes to grading the responses, I don't go to the threaded discussion itself. I go to speed grader. And then that's where I read the responses. So that really helps me out. Oh, who asked me that question? I, I did. Who's I? I'm sorry, I have. Dave. Um, Dave, why don't you and I talk a little bit more about that? How does that sound later on? Okay. Okay, other questions real fast? I wanna to get to my last slide. I was so pleased with my last slide for this show. Oh, please, let's see it. Okay, um, I'm going to have to go through. Okay, close your eyes, everybody. I'm going through a bunch of slides quickly. Look at all that stuff I still wanted to talk to you about. Okay, so here's my last slide. Let's get our students talking to each other online. I want to thank you. Thank you again for coming to this session, and I hope it's been helpful. Thank you.
<laughs> so that's it. I'm going to call it a day. Sue, you want to take me off? All right. I will close the recording, but not before thanking you publicly and enthusiastically. Thank you. That was really wonderful. Oh, well, thank you to everyone. You guys asked really good questions. I appreciate that. As you can tell, I'm, I'm a threaded discussion cheerleader type. I've never heard anybody use the phrase threaded discussion superstar before. So. Oh, really? <laughs> Just, oh. <laughs>